So th thank you first, everybody from the CLIP team and everybody who's been engaged in organizing everything for this conference. This has been a wonderful and very warm welcome that we all have met so far. Uh, I will take this moment to say, say something about the... Before we see the comparative work that we are now about to, to start working on, I will say something about the, how we got here, how come we ended up with this comparative uh, projects, and, but also to really stress the importance of this moment. So as we have heard, this conference and meeting is to a large extent devoted to one of the methodological approaches of Mr. Urban Futures, one which we have not yet fully explored, and that is the one of comparative urban research. And in the Mr. Urban Futures intention to develop research, to contribute, to re realization of just cities, we have structured the research methodologically on, on different levels. So first and foremost is the conviction that we need to learn about and to be able to meet global challenges uh, through building connections between different geographical contexts. And secondly, each one of these geographical contexts, which we call platforms, have also organized the integration of knowledge from practice and academy in, in very different kinds of setups, building on different kinds of agreements, each one of them suitable to the context in which they perform. Further, each platform investigates how, do, how to do trans, trans, transdisciplinary research, which kinds of methods are relevant for the local context, which kinds of learnings are made. And the comparative urban research is yet a layer to add to this organizational setup of knowledge production. Maybe it's not the last, but at least it's the latest introduced cornerstone to the Mr. Urban Futures research strategy. So from tomorrow afternoon, many of the different researchers and practitioners who are here present in the room and all involved in projects at local levels will team up in new cross-international settings and start to investigate the potential for doing comparative research across a set of varying themes. For some of the themes, there are already a lot of local research going on and maybe even collaborations across the platforms. Other themes are quite new and not yet established at all at every platform, and hence this meeting is the first scanning of what are the points of possible interaction. To add is that the way the research has been carried out locally is also varying. In some cases, themes have been evoked through networks. In others, where research has been running for many years already, a number of parallel research projects are well established and have in their turn evolved into a large number of sub-themes. But from tomorrow, Mr. Urban Future as a center will try to pencil out the future strategies of this new research phase. In this sense, it is an important moment for the coming work on Mr. Ben Future, and it is the moment to enter a common direction in a new manner, but also to break new grounds together. So how have we entered this moment? What has been prior to the decision of performing comparative urban research? The local research and the local different contexts co-produced by practitioners and academics jointly have always been at the core of Mr. Urban Future. And consequently, a large number of research projects have been developed during the years relevant to each specific context and its local stakeholders, but also with clear intentions to speak across the platforms and to congregate into certain relevant thematics of greater global significance. As such, we find themes on food security, on transport accessibility, on participatory city making, as we already heard a lot about, how culture and cultural heritage contributes to urban sustainability, etc. And these projects have been located within three, what we have called major tracks, that each platform has related to in its different and locally significant ways. In parallel, projects have also emerged on a reflective level in asking how do this research contribute to greater knowledge about the city and its management, its physical appearance and its livability? And how does it affect urban governance and hence urban change? And ultimately to ask how does all this work contribute to wider knowledge about what significates a just city and a possible 
realization of justice in different contexts. So at this point, we will yet take a step further than merely putting the different local research activities next to each other, but instead make not only collaborative efforts across the different contexts, but also comparative analysis of how the local embedded research is reflected, regarded, and possibly transformed into other contexts. So moving from a set of parallel thematics with local projects and local stakeholder concerns, we're now aiming for le new learning cross cross platform research and common thematic engagements. However, we might first ask ourselves why to engage in such complicated endeavor as comparative urban research, as the research approach of, of transdisciplinarity is in many ways, as you all know, complicated enough. For any one of you who has grown up with siblings, you know that comparison is basis for justice. How many mothers have struggled with this issue to be a fair mother by comparing the amount of benefits and challenges that are given to each one of her children? And every child has the experience and effects of com comparison of distribution and recognition deeply embedded in his or her understanding of the world. And this goes for urban justice as well. Comparing distribution of resources, recognition of places and citizens, and the level of representation in different urban groups, to speak with the three terms of social justice elaborated, elaborated on by Nancy Fraser, is one way to acknowledge injustices through making differences visible. And this kind of comparison usually goes across local or regional context, comparing the differences in for example, high-income areas versus low-income areas, to argue, argue for development combating segregation and the injustices that arise from uneven development, from uneven urban preconditions. However, in this case, we will compare across national contexts, where not only the income levels differ, but actually most of the basic conditions for urban development are radically different. Is there then a good reason to do comparative work from such diverse contexts? and what could possibly be the benefit for each one of the local geographies involved. A general beneficial outcome of such comparative work is, of course, the creation of alliances across national contexts that could support awareness making of topical but not necessarily prioritized issues in each local environment. But in brief, one could list the few strategies of comparison that would not only benefit a local policy making, but could possibly also contribute to relevant global knowledge of how to make cities just and sustainable. A first such issue could be, or maybe is comparing to find similarities. One assumption of such approach would be to claim that with similar urban problems evolving, no matter context, and with well working or possibly good solution, to such similar problem, one could build a multifaceted and robust body of knowledge about how to address certain urban challenges. A second strategy could be to compare by detecting differences. Within every theme established, we could imagine problems evolving very differently in each of the local contexts. Solution would then address problems of different characters. However, it would not, did, this would not necessarily imply that these solutions would only belong to a specific local context, but rather that they are or could be unforeseen in the others. As an example, we could take the now very well known case of participatory budgeting that originally stems from a specific Brazilian local context, but is now being interpreted and implemented in various cities across the globe. And this would probably not have happened if the knowledge about this approach hadn't been carried by engaged individuals across national context and in general very well communicated as a transformative st strategy towards higher participation on an impact on, on urban governance. In this way, urban differences could put the spotlight on local matters with transformative capacity that then could be transferred into varying new contexts. A third way of comparing could be by trying to understand the direction and the intensity of ongoing urban change in each local context towards what the current direction is leading could be more easily understood through the mirroring in the process of change of another urban context. 
Each specific urban context would then be able to distinguish its own development in the reflection of the differing perspectives provided by other situations. And finally, in coming back to the intention of realizing just cities, we could compare to understand the conditions of change itself. Who guides change in each context? What mechanism makes it take place? Who does urban change in? What does urban change imply and for whom? Each local context will provide a specific set of replies to these questions, and again, would give a richer and more comprehensive knowledge about how to manage to make cities capable of providing good living condi conditions for citizens without endangering a common future. As you soon will be presented to some of these themes, I will just take a moment to reflect further on the possible and expected outcomes of the work. And in reading the briefs for the pro projects, we can distinguish certain assumed objectives. The first one is about creating a new kind of space for building relationships, sharing experiences, and engage in joint reflection in pursuit of comparative policy and practitioner and academic output. So here we see an approach based on the inherent capacity of extended relational research activity, creating an enabling joint space for discussions. A second ambition speaks towards generating comparative insights to generate a greater knowledge base for a deepened policy, for a deepened practice space and academic understanding. And this ambition speaks towards broadening the base for decision and research through this comparative experience. A third objective is, uh, is to actually provide policymakers and regional stakeholders with a set of ideas, experiences, and evidence, and with opportunities to initiate, research, test, and implement evidence-based solutions in local contexts. So here the comparative project becomes like a stage that produces different kind of knowledges and that invites different kind of stakeholders to test new thinking. A fourth ambition still is to, distingu to distinguish from the brief is to be able to disseminate recommendations, knowledges and experiences to a, a wider audience by engaging cross-national context, a wide set of stakeholders will de facto be involved and results will reach a larger audience for greater impact. So the comparative projects penciled out so far all have different origins, they have different objectives, and will be organized differently. As they have emerged from different contexts, needs, and research motivations, they will also be designed and, and carried out differently. So it's rather the approach of co-production as a mode of addressing complex urban issues. And the further objective, of course, of, of realizing just cities, that will be the common denominator as they carry out the ethos of the center. So beyond the ones presented here, there are also comparative work taking place around the urban SDGs, about how knowledge is transferred from practice to academy and vice versa, and on the overall theme of the center of how to realize just cities. So what we now will get is a short introduction to each one of the themes. Each speaker will give us an understanding of the urgency and the topicality of each thematic, a larger picture of which current global challenges are addressed by each one of the themes, and hence, they will be explaining uh, the relevance of each theme in relation to the, the work of Mr. Urban Futures. So I will invite to the stage first Professor Stephen Agong, who you all know, so I don't think I need to introduce you further, but I <laughs> just hand over the microphone to you. Thank you so much, uh, Andretta, for that elaborate uh, background. Um, I would like to just underscore uh, a few points about this um, international collaborative project um, under the theme Urban Food Security and Va uh, Value Chain. Um, as we see it here today, globally, um, we find that uh, Close to about a billion people are living on less than a dollar a day. And therefore, they cannot even afford the basic necessity in terms of food. 
Forget about even the quality, the health status of that uh, food. And therefore, as um, a center and as different LIPs, we felt that this is an, uh, an area which urgently needs attention, especially if we are going to empower the citizenry in our respective LIPs. And there are various actors we are talking about here, namely the farmers, uh, the input like fertilizer producers, and even those who are involved, for example, in the general distribution and marketing of the uh, food stuff we are talking about. And therefore, uh, looking at that entire uh, scenario, we come close to a situation where if that chain is empowered, then we will not only make available food on the table at affordable uh, cost and available at a time that is convenient and also um, supplied uh, in the various cities we are talking about, but we'll also be empowering people to get jobs, to get employed, so that uh, the production of food, uh, pr processing of the food, preparation of the food, consumption of the food as a chain is a complete value chain. In our context, especially if you're talking about Kisumu, uh, you are talking about Cape Town, you are talking about Greater Manchester uh, and even Gothenburg, those are the LRPs which are currently involved in this particular international collaboration. We see some uh, common denominators uh, across the board and um, for some cities like Gothenburg, Greater Manchester, the quality of food may not be a major concern, granted that um, in terms of quality processes, that is fairly developed. But a case like Kisumu and Cape Town, we see that they still need an urgent need for serious quality assurance processes. And then the processes involved in terms of value addition are fairly well developed in the north as compared to the south. But for us to come, with, uh, come up with meaningful ideas, policy guidelines that can be adopted across the board, this international collaboration is essential. Uh, in terms of uh, issues of distribution and even transportation, as well as even governance and legislation, um, as well as even the policies we are talking about, the, there are common grounds that uh, we could benefit by sharing the knowledge, the, the knowledge which is co-produced. Uh, however, you will all recall that um, in the current um, sustainable development goals, food security is still a major issue. It was a major issue even in the Millennium Development Goals, but it's still a major issue today. I would want to illustrate a simple example of uh, edible insects, which currently Jaramogo Gingodinga University of Science and Technology is working on. We got a World Bank funding of about 600 million uh, uh, to set up a center of excellence in this particular um, sector. But if, from the face value, you may think that edible insect is just edible insect. Yet, when you look at the production of this edible insect, processing of this edible insect, uh, and then distribution, marketing, and consumption, if we were to engage people in various aspects of the value chain, you'd, you'd be surprised. Um, using an example of um, uh, dragonfly, which is majorly produced as feed for fish, that would offer employment and opportunity for a lot of Kenyans. Secondly, when you feed the fish in the lake, as we do currently uh, through our cage fish farming project, you find that you get fish readily available on time, right quality, then uh, right size, and you can easily get it to the market uh, easily at an affordable price that the consumer would not be strained in uh, paying for. And at the same time, it would also address the issue of poverty that we are talking about. Uh, between ourselves, that is uh, CLIP and Cape Town, we are currently concluding a study on consuming urban poverty, uh, uh, a project that is funded by DFID, and we have just started another project on nourishing space uh, funded by IDRC uh, Canada. And if it were not for the LIP 
concept and also the Minister of Futures concept to allow international collaboration, these funders would not be coming on board. Ladies and gentlemen, I think um, as we sit here today, we have just had breakfast, and I hope it was good breakfast. And uh, we also had uh, tea break or coffee break. But last night, one thing which came up after the dinner, that it was uh, fairly rich in everything. Uh, fruit, it was fairly rich in vegetables, it was fairly rich in proteins. And this lady uh, we are citing here is so happy and so satisfied that if you can make every one of us so happy and satisfied, we'll have a blessed global village. And uh, indeed, every one of us would have been empowered. We do not need to struggle over our resources if every one of us, with our vegetables, she's happy, happy to go. And she's an example of what I would call uh, a happy citizen within the city set, uh, setting. And this is what we are striving to, to, to really get to the, uh, at the very uh, best. Uh, uh, last but not least, um, I know here we are assembled. Um, uh, some of us are joining us for the first time, but there's still room and space for collaboration under this particular thematic area, urban food security and value chain. And I believe that uh, through the workshops that we'll be taking um, through uh, from, um, uh, especially on, on Thursday, uh, going forward, we will also see a lot of opportunity uh, in terms of uh, the collaboration that we can uh, underscore through this particular thematic area. And um, uh, one key uh, derivative out of this uh, particular project is that uh, for a long time, we have been thinking of our best Kisumu city can produce and reduce on the burden of import. As we sit here today, we, we import vegetables as far as about 1,000 kilometers away from Kisumu city. Yet, we are bordered here, the lake is just uh, our biggest resource that we have. And I, working with the city, uh, the city and also the county government, we can reduce this burden. If we can get fruits and vegetables all the way from Meru, that demonstrates that uh, there's a lot that we could do so that we reduce the cost of this food. And I, even the, the, the loss in between because of transportation would be uh, minimized. And I think policy guidelines would help us and given that even the governor is represented here quite well, uh, uh, we can work together with the city. Um, we can work together with the, the city and the, the county government to ensure that this Great Lake uh, becomes the major solution to our problems, the major solutions to our uh, poverty issues, the major solution to our food problems, and the major solution to our empowerment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Our next theme is about migration and urban development. And I invite here Helene Holmström, who is head of operations and integration in the city of Go Gothenburg. And Helene has been working with refugee and migration questions on a municipality level for more than 25 years, from different positions, also as a teacher and as a principal, but more strategically as well, from the city office Gothenburg, and here since about a year as the head of operations. And current focus of your work is on the strategic level, on integration questions, and on the situation of un unaccompanied minors. And previously, you have been working arrival of asylum seekers, both practically and strategically. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank you very much for inviting me for this conference. It, uh, I have joined it very much since I came. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk about migration and urban development. I could have chosen a picture of, picture of migration, uh, migrants walking along the streets or walking along uh, uh, through Europe or in a tent uh, area or something like that. But I chose those pictures because this is also a picture of migration. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, the three pictures to the left are my former students coming from Afghanistan, Kurdistan, Somalia. And the right person is an old man in a traditional Swedish clothes, but he's also a migrant. He comes from Estonia. He came after the war to Sweden, the Second World War to Sweden. And they all met at the same time at the Culture Fest a festival in my school. I think it's love. They are lovely pictures. Well, you can see the numbers here. I'm not going to talk so much about the numbers because they are facts. They are from the UNHCR from June 17 uh, this year. So this is what we are facing. This is, this is reality. Migration is much more than, than just refugees, of course. It's also people coming out of love or a family reunification. And it's also about students and labor market and so on. Uh, but the most challenging thing for us in Sweden and in Gothenburg right now is the refugee situation. So I'm going to talk mostly of that, but not only. Uh, Gothenburg has always been a city of migration. It was built by the Dutch and the Germans, and we had a lot of people from Great Britain living there in the 17th and 7th and 18th century. And we have labor, labor market people coming to us, and now mostly of them are refugees. Uh, and our, uh, we're always talking about a sustain, sustainable city open for the world. That's our motto for the city. But the last few years, it has been a real challenge. Uh, in Sweden, we are 10 million people. And in, 19, in 2015, 163,000 new asylum seekers came to Sweden. In October and November, two years ago, Almost 80,000 people, 80, people came in two months as asylum seekers. And that's what we are dealing with right now in the municipalities. As you can see, it's a big challenge. And what we can see, one challenge, uh, challenge is that what we did in 2015, we are not used to do things like that in Sweden. Sweden is a quite a regulated country. You do everything the right way. You, you, uh, first you, you get born, you, go to, you get registered, then you go into the vaccination program, then you start a preschool, and, the, and, and so on. It's all regulated. And 163,000 people coming in this way. And we had to do everything at the same time. Uh, so, it's, of course, it's quite challenging. And it's also a lot of laws around everything we do in Sweden. And we have to break a lot of laws to, to manage to, to do this. Uh, but it also started a lot of cooperation, and a lot of new cooperation. We didn't even know that we could cooperate with other parts of the municipality and the society. And it started in that autumn. But what we are facing right now is now the control systems are coming after us, looking at us and saying, no, you didn't follow that law. You didn't follow that law. You didn't follow that law. No, we didn't, but we managed to take care of everybody. We managed to get them somewhere to sleep. We managed to get them into schools. We managed to do a lot of things. But we are not talking so much about it anymore. We're just talking about what we didn't do. <laughs> and I think it's quite interesting because it makes something with the people who really worked in the autumn of 2015, trying to do the very best. And now they can hear that, no, you didn't do the right things. So that makes something out of the will to do it again. It might be uh, more and more difficult next time. Uh, out of those 160,000 coming to Sweden, almost 80,000 are or will be rejected. So that's a new challenge for us. We have always had some undocumented people in Sweden, but not so many. What we can see now is that they are rejected, they are supposed to go back home, but they don't. They stay in Sweden anyway. And our society is not made for that. So what shall we give them? How much can, shall we support them? The national level says, no, you're not supposed to support them at all. But in the municipality, they're living in the municipality. We're meeting them, we're seeing them. We can't just say no. They can't sleep on the streets. Sweden is a cold country. Right now, it's raining a lot. And uh, we come, it's coming winter. They can't sleep on the street. You have a responsibility for, you, for the municipality. But the national level says, no, you shouldn't. They should leave. And uh, of course, we have to pay for helping them, of course. 
You have high taxes in Sweden. We have a, 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 a big welfare system. We pay a lot of taxes, but we also get a lot back. So that's kind of an of a unwritten agreement. I pay a lot of taxes, but I can also be sure that if something happens to me, the, national, the, the, uh, the society will help me. But what happens now? We have to give a lot of our tax money to help people who shouldn't be in Sweden. And what happens to that? Where is the level where people will say, no, I won't pay any tax anymore? And then what happens to the society? So that's another challenge for us. <clears throat> uh, I'm just going to talk about challenges. There are a lot of possibilities. I hope you can see that I really mean that. But I'm going to talk about the challenges right now. <laughs> Another challenge is housing, of course. We have a lack, lack of apartments in Sweden since 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and now we're having a lot of people coming in this way from the side. They haven't been queuing for an apartment, as my daughter and my son has done. They will be waiting five and a half years in Gothenburg to get an apartment. And now we're having a lot of people coming from the side who need somewhere to live. They are allowed to be in Sweden. They have got the permission to stay, but they can't go into the ordinary labor market because they have to have an apartment now. They can't wait for five years. <coughs> so uh, right now we're trying to find ways. We are taking some apartments for those coming here and some for the others. But where is the limit? How many can we give to those people? without having a struggle with the other society. That means me and my children, if you understand what I mean. There is a limit somewhere. I don't know where it is right now. But right now we are, we are keeping on it. So that's another challenge. As we are, I don't know how much time I have, but I think I have a lot more, yes. Uh, the labor market, the labor market, of course. We are a very specialized labor market in Sweden. You get uh, educated and you go into special different uh, paths of in, in the labor market. And a lot of people come in with a lot of skills, but they're not comparative to our labor market. In Sweden, you need to have the paper, you have to be educated, you have to, can, to show that you're educated. So even if people are coming with a lot of skills, they might not have their papers with them. Of course not, because they're refugees. So how can we match them into the labor market? And of course, nobody knows Swedish when they come. It's we are small countries, not in, not language you know. So we have to learn the Swedish. We have to to educate them to put them into the labor market. And if we don't, we still have the problem. How many could live in Sweden without paying taxes? Until the system breaks. <coughs> Until the other people saying no, we're not interested in paying so much taxes anymore because I don't get enough back. Uh, today, it takes sometimes between seven and nine years for a newcomer to come into the labor market, for 50% of them. And then, then it takes another 10 years for the other 50%. So after 20 years, still 25% of the refugees are not in the labor market. Uh, we are also a kind of... A, special country, or we're a little bit exotic in Swedish, Sweden, because we have, uh, I think we're the most equal, gender equal country in the world, with women's rights and so on, uh, and we are very strong in that, and we are having people coming from other traditions, with another, uh, another view of those, uh, those things, and how much should we force them, and how much should we keep them, could they keep their own tra tradition when they come to our society? And if we don't, uh, promote traditional uh, societies. Uh, shall, can they keep? How much can they keep of their own tradition? And how much do they have to force to get into our tradition? What happens when there are def different laws in different kinds of the society? Sometimes we, we are a little bit too, too afraid for conflicts, so we allow things for refugees or for our people outside to do things that we should never allow ourselves to do. And what happens in that? Not by the rules, not in the legislation, but as uh, people working in the municipalities. We can sometimes be a little bit more, um, accept a little bit more from some people than we do from others. 
What happens then in a, in a municipality? Democracy. Uh, we have, uh, uh, um, when we have uh, um, elections in Sweden, about 80-90% of us go voting. We're using our right to vote. We can see in those groups coming to Sweden for, for the last 20-30 years, uh, the election rate, they are about between 15-60%. So a lot of them don't go voting. And how do they feel that they are part of the society, of the municipality, if they don't use the right to vote? Is it a sign of not feeling that they are part? Is it a sign that they don't want to? Is it a sign that they don't understand? Or what is it? So that's something we have, I think we have to look much more of. Uh, because if you don't use your right to vote, then you're not really part of it. Or you might not really be part of it, as we were talking about earlier today. The last thing I wanted to, to uh, uh, mention is about the difference between the national level and the local level in those questions, or it could be a difference, I would say. Uh, Gothenburg has always been very open to the migrants. 25% were born outside, as I said. So for us, it's not a, a real problem. Uh, there's no difference between the national level and the local level. But there are municipalities in, Gotham, in, in Sweden saying that, no, we don't want any refugees. We don't want to. And the national level, uh, level says you have to. Uh, in other parts of, of Europe, you can see the, the, other, the other way around. The national level says, no, we're not taking in the refugees, but the cities want to do it. So how can you cope with that uh, difference? Because it's not so easy to do it. Uh, so there is a, a gap sometimes between the national level and the local level. Um, so I think I end there. There are a lot of challenges and, of course, a lot of opportunities. I'll talk about them another time. Yes, thank you, Helene. This is one of the new themes that I mentioned earlier that Mr. Ben Future is taking on. So the opportunities will be explored from now on. Next theme is transportation and urban development. And I invite Professor George Mark Onyango to the stage. So, Professor George Marconiango is professor at Masena University School of Planning and Architecture, and your research interests and focuses of practice are matters of urban management with emphasis on community participation. And you are working with engaging planners in how to refocus urban planning to urban management issues in a country like Kenya, where you say planning without management consideration has been the norm. That's your and thank you very much. Um, it, it is a, a pleasure to be standing in front of you here to share something that we started last year in Gothenburg when we began exploring some of these issues about transportation and urban development, <clears throat> but specifically focusing on urban station communities. So the comparative study research is on urban station communities. Um, I think we all know that there's a connection between transportation and urban development. It's something that we've been taught for years and so on. You've interacted with it and so on. And the concept of surplus, whether it's surplus production in agriculture, surplus production in industry, surplus production of human beings, is closely interlinked with transportation and urban development. And that then forms the nexus of what it is that you're talking about. Um, there are many examples that you can be able to bring in terms of how transportation and urban development has uh, interacted, starting from European history, where you look at the Roman roads and how the Roman roads created some of the major cities that you have in Europe. Look at Africa and look at some of those caravan trails and how they created urban centers, especially in this country. And then comes the railroad. And the railroad had actually a very major impact in terms of urban development because rails are kind of uh, inflexible, unlike car trucks. So urban development uh, deriving from railroad development has its own unique challenges. And that's when we were discussing last year how to address some of those issues. And we said, why don't we do a comparative study of some of the cities that we have in this particular collaboration? So we had uh, a team from Sweden 
from Kenya and from Cape Town, uh, looking at the railway communities, the urban railway communities, and how these urban railway communities are able to create uh, unique environments. Um, the most important thing is that railway communities have tended to be less dense than other areas because of the nature of development of the railway system itself. And I'll be giving examples from Kisumu because uh, that would enable us to be able to go into details tomorrow when you're going into the breakout groups and you look at the details of some of those developments. Um, something that people always forget is that Kenya was never created as a country. Kenya was an, a company that was formed by some British uh, entrepreneurs, Imperial East African British uh, Company. This company bought this large piece of wasteland called Kenya, which was basically semi-arid. And they discovered they couldn't do much with this semi-arid track, because at that time, Kenya was reaching up to somewhere near Naivasha. And so they decided to extend their influence into the area that was productive, what was then called Uganda. And that meant changing the strategy. So the strategy was dissolving this company and handing over to the British government and to set up the colony. So this British government, with a bit of money and a bit of negotiations and so on, managed to fund a railway line from Mombasa to Uganda. In other words, a railway line from Mombasa to Naivasha, and Naivasha was then Uganda, where they would be able to get all these resources to extract them back to the mother uh, land, uh, England then. So basically, the railway line is then de developed as an extractive transportation network. I'm not sure about uh, South Africa, because they're also uh, having similar histories as we have in Kenya, where you have railway lines also developing as means of extracting resources from the hinterland to the core. And I'm sure, although Sweden has many more years of rail development, but the trend seems to be the same. Usually the railway line has been an issue of extracting resources and getting them out. In that particular process, the technology then determined what kind of development you have. Um, I remember when we had steam engines, I remember because I used it once, the train would have to stop every 100 kilometers so that they could put back water into the boiler and so on. That stop then became an urban center. So you have urban centers at almost 100 kilometer intervals because of water that was required to refill the steam engine. And those urban centers are what we call Kenya right now in terms of urban development. So you're actually seeing that the railway community is growing around the technology. So what happens when the technology improves? You move from steam engine to diesel and electric locomotive engines. The interval between the towns becomes bigger. So the smaller towns in between are actually dying. And you have the bigger towns coming up, the ones that uh, require um, more infrastructure to sustain this improved technology. And currently, we are going to the next stage where the train from Mombasa to Nairobi is supposedly pretty fast, taking four hours. Uh, when you say four hours is pretty fast, compare that with a whole night trip. We'd get into the train at six in the evening and get to Mombasa the following day at 10. So that's a major transformation. But that has implications in terms of what happens in between Nairobi and Mombasa. And that same railway line is being extended from Nairobi to Kisumu. What is going to happen to the urban areas that were relying on this particular railway line to grow in terms of uh, in urban infrastructure, and urban growth, and so on? And that's why I was giving just an example of some of the things that would happen. Uh, if you look at our picture here, we have the railway station, the current railway station, which is moribund. And then we have the proposed new railway station, grandiose, and all that. What are the implications in terms of the urban station communities that are operating in that particular area. And we can begin to see the imp impact on some of these things when you look at the stretch that has been completed between Nairobi and Mombasa. We have new towns coming up because of these new railway stations with new infrastructure, with new services, with new facilities, with new opportunities that are actually then accruing. But that has an implication on the old station communities. And so I'll do a fast forward to Kisumu. When you look at the railway station in Kisumu, the relocation of the proposed railway station also means that 
the existing railway station communities will be impacted negatively because the proposal is to move the railway station from its current location to some place further out near Kibos, where there's more land, where they can be able to put up this uh, lots of support infrastructure for parking and so on for the railway station. Um, the most important thing about the railway system, for example, in Kenya, was the classification. The railway, the train itself used to have first class, second class, and third class passengers. And so you had different services depending on what class you're traveling. So first class passengers had coaches and they had beddings and they had dinner with the big cutlery and crockery and all the gizmos that go with first class. Then there were those people who were aspiring to be in first class called second class. They had a bit of the same, but not much of it. And then you had the third class who was the people who just wanted to get from point A to point B. Now, the railway community were also classified the same way. So you had the people who were working at administration, administration level at the higher levels were in first class, they also travel in first class train, they also live in first, first class neighborhoods. Where we are right now is basically railway community land, where most of the first class housing were, and as we go to the field, we'll be able to see some of them. Then we had the people who were in the second class, who had uh, uh, two, three bedroom houses built with a reasonable compound, and they were able to also enjoy the same benefits, a bit like the first class, and also travel by train first class. But the most interesting was the lumpen, the major workers who are taking care of the railway system. They occupy most of the land that is uh, designated as railway land, for example, in Kisumu. They were not supposed to have a lot of amenities. I remember in the 60s, they even had uh, the radio station was in the railway station. It had two channels. In your house, you only had a switch on and off, one and two. So if you wanted channel one, you switch channel one and then channel two. That was offered to them because all the houses for the third class were networked and the radio station was in the railway station and the station must have been switching on the radio for them. So those kind of social stratification in terms of housing was linked to the railway station itself and the railway community. And that has manifested itself to date. If you look at the housing in this, uh, what we call the railway communities in Kisumu, we'll be able to identify some of these different categories of housing within the railway community, and you look at the quality of housing and the implications. So what happens, the railways decide that um, since they were changing the structure of managing the railway systems, they'd also change the structure of housing. And this was a, a typical proposal down here of how they could be able to redevelop some of those railway lands, uh, move out the so-called uh, low-class uh, railway workers, and put up a massive complex of office blocks and five-star hotels. I think they're supposed to be three five-star hotels and a lot of other development under what they're calling the Lake City. So they have this dream of what to do with the land, but as it is right now, the land is still underutilized. The properties are those houses that were built 70 years ago with materials that was designed to last forever because um, the, the roofing sheets were done with very good materials. You can't even repair them because the nails that we make right now can't go through those iron sheets. They bend. The, the walls are made of very good stone. So those houses will last for another 1,000 years if we let them to be. But the use of the land is the issue because the railways occupied prime land. And so because they occupied prime land, the value of that particular property keeps on going up. And if you know the Kenyan politics of land, I'm sure the C, incoming CEC will have that challenge. Yes, you have land outside there, but the railway land is very prime because that's the area where you can be able to your CBD. That's the area where you can be able to put in some of those facilities I'm talking about. Those areas that you can be able to use to actually create some levels of equality because the location of those particular properties. Near the CBD, at the heart of the town, and on the very good areas network. So, um, interestingly, the Kisumu city has developed an integrated strategic urban development plan and has identified the railway land as a special planning area. I think they are caught up between the legal aspects and the realities of redevelopment area because um, 
the property belongs to railways, and railways is a state corporation which has its own uh, legal jurisdiction and what it can do, what it can't do, and the city cannot just take that land. So the issue of managing the legislative aspects of acquiring that land for expansion and improvement of the city continues being an issue. And I'm sure that if we look at the other cities in which we're doing the comparative studies, the locations of the railway station, the station communities have the same challenges because the railways were located in strategic places and they still attract a premium in terms of land value. So that is going to be the core of this comparative study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these very interesting insights. And the next theme is about culture, heritage, and urban development. And I invite Riki Sitas to the stage, Dr. Riki Sitas, who is the researcher from African Center of the Cities, but also uh, the coordinator at the, urban, at the local interaction platform. And your distinctive research interests embrace art, culture, heritage, and the matter of just cities. And more specifically, you're developing research around artful urbanism, creative southern geographies, and urban humanities. Thank you. And um, thank you for such a warm welcome and delicious food and insightful content so far. And I think um, uh, it really looks like our cultural, social, and intellectual needs are being looked after really well here. And I think sometimes we forget how important that is, that a lot of the way that we dictate our lives and to make decisions is around our social and cultural lives and what music we listen to, what food we eat, um, and how we can behave in society. Um, and, you know, how we misbehave in society. I'm sure everybody can admit to have done something unhealthy in the last 48 hours. Um, but, but often uh, research and planning doesn't always take this into account. Uh, especially with the magnitude of urban, uh, urban challenges, a lot of it is focused on the economic, the political, um, and, and the social, cultural dimensions sometimes get a little bit lost. And so this is one of the, one of the reasons that we are really interested in exploring uh, cultural heritage in the just city. Um, and this is also something that UCLG has recognized and has been uh, promoting the, the, that uh, culture be recognized as the fourth pillar of democracy. I mean, of self-sustainability, sorry, and, and to think about culture in, in, in broader ways. So thinking of culture as, culture as intangible and tangible capital, culture as a process and a way of life, culture as value binding, and culture as creative expression. Um, and this is also the very, very difficult thing about culture is that it can get stuck to anything and everything, and it can be quite difficult to pin down. Um, but at the same time, we feel it's very important. When you look at the SDGs, though, you see a slightly different picture, where there's a very limited focus on culture and heritage. Um, in fact, a culture and heritage are only really thought of as um, natural and cultural heritage, and largely focused on the, on the natural side of heritage, um, and diversity. And so some of the nuance of the way that culture gets stuck to everything um, it is possibly lost in the, in, the, in the SDG process, but is very evident in the new urban agenda. Possibly maybe to, in, a, in a too broader sense, but I think we've got to think really carefully about how we start thinking through these different perspectives of culture and, and heritage in society. Um, and it's also very difficult to operationalize because um, art, culture, and heritage are often compartmentalized as a separate thing to the rest of everyday life and the rest of uh, dealing with cities. Um, and so uh, often with um, art, culture, and um, heritage, there's policy conflations. And, a lot of the time that policy is, is, is deeply informed by global policy processes like UNESCO, and despite the best intentions of these policies, that, which are very well researched and, and beautifully written, the way they land is often very different in different contexts. So, for example, um, what, what, what seems to happen a lot in the African context is that it's been a way to prop up colonial institutions, colo protect colonial architecture, um, and instead of necessarily like supporting the the way that we think of our culture and just cities. But still, there are such exciting projects happening across the world and in all of our local interaction platforms. Um, and we've just, uh, we, we have commenced our um, comparative work um, in the past year, and one of the outputs has been a report on festivals, which will be coming out soon. 
And um, so one of the things about festivals is that, is that it challenges this idea of, of how culture and heritage should be or could be expressed and engage people in cities. And so we've got some examples from um, Gamla Stad and Jazz Festival in, um, in Sweden, Fitas Festival in South Africa, Dunga Fish, uh, Fish Night here, and then there's, uh, there's all sorts of other festivals like the Chale Wate Street Art Festival in Accra in Ghana. So there's this big push to rethink the way that we think about tangible and intangible heritage in various cities. And this is helpful to challenge the normative notions. Um, and this is a lot what, what when you mentioned artful urbanisms. It's how do you start thinking through these cultural ac activities as, way to, as other ways of understanding the urban. Um, another part of the big part of the discourse around cultural heritage is around creative cities and, and um, cultural industries. And uh, this is largely around thinking that uh, if you capture and support uh, creative uh, cities and cultural industries, then it'll have an economic impact, it'll um, uh, provide job creation and have some kind of economic trickle down that, that can really um, help with, with society. Um, but um, unfortunately, in a lot of contexts, this is, all this has resulted in is propping up elites. We see culture-based gentrification being something that's very common across the world. Um, and, uh, and then it ends up sort of supporting particular kinds of cultural industry and creative industries, such as the contemporary art, um, and, and, and particularly the formal art markets, uh, film, design, um, and, um, so, and so, to some extent craft, but those have not necessarily been developed and don't actually create the livelihoods that, that are expected. But what about the informal economy? And I think that's something that hasn't really been thought through in, a, in, um, in, in terms of culture um, and heritage, where most people are operating in the informal creative economy. And what does that mean? Uh, there are backyard recording studios in every city across this continent. There are people who use electricity from someone's house to, to um, a, a power a performance that's gonna happen in public space. So there's a whole different kind of economy that hasn't necessarily been explored um, that, that shows up the, 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 that there's simultaneously different kinds of cultural activities happening um, and that there's a disjuncture sometimes in terms of whose interests these serve. Uh, and so one of the ways that has, has found traction globally is this idea of cultural planning. And the idea is that cultural planning can offer quite a, 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 a more nuanced way to think about how we plan for culture in cities. Um, so, you know, it can, for one, it can identify cultural practice. A lot of these invisible practices that, that are, um, are sometimes not recognized uh, build communities and build social cohesion. Um, and uh, contribute to placemaking and place identities using a culture-based approach. And especially at, at, um, around the youth, who, uh, who are often not necessarily engaged as, uh, as profoundly as they could be in, in many of these things. But there's a challenge. There's a huge challenge in financing. And I just, I'll use one example, and this is from research from last year, so please, um, uh, UK friends, <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong. But I just did a, a quick comparison of the National Arts Council funding in South Africa versus the National Arts Council funding in the UK, which um, have similar, with, which, with England, the England um, National Arts Culture funding. And um, whereas England has got $450 million, South Africa has got $7.5 million a year, which is a massive difference. And I couldn't find data on, on Kenya. So, and I, um, so there's a huge, massive problem with financing and resources. And where the financing does happen, from my studies in, in South Africa, is that it does prop up colonial institutions and colonial practices. So a lot of the money goes into the Philharmonic Orchestra, into the National Theatre, into the National Ballet, into the National Opera, and doesn't necessarily go to support the kinds of cultural actions that are happening that would, would, would stimulate more just um, cities. Um, and so we do need to think about what better policy will, what can emerge from looking across these different contexts. But looking at this, uh, look at, looking at these differences is difficult. It is incredibly difficult. And difference and diversity and dissensus are challenging and they make people feel very uncomfortable and they're very difficult in practical reality to address. Um, and often culture can be used to mask conservative and problematic power relations. We can see this in, with Trump. <laughs> we can see this with women, most, with the way women are treated m almost everywhere in the world. And we can see this in the way that, people, that LGBTI communities are dealt with in Africa. So um, on a basic level, how we think and talk about the intersections of race, class, gender, sexuality, 
is largely, can, for, you know, can be supported by thinking through how we view cultural heritage and just cities. Um, so finally, yes, cultural heritage and the just city. Um, what does that entail? So some of our starting points and some of the points that we've been trying to uh, um, unpack in the past year and we hope to be doing more of going for further is, is rethinking the centrality of global imperatives, thinking what that means across different um, scales and sites, challenging assumptions about tangible, intangible heritage through new temporal and spatial imaginaries. I mean, it's difficult to think through time and space if you're trying to work on a, if, you, if you're trying to make a living on a daily basis, it's difficult to try and think of a plan that's going to impact 50 years when everyone in this room is dead. It's a, you know, it's a, we need to have new imaginaries for these things. Rethinking creative economies and thinking how the formal and the informal are entangled in order to transform funding and support streams. Um, and explore opportunities for cultural, urban, uh, cultural and urban policy and, res and resource and institutional coalitions. Um, especially in the interest of thinking through resilience as a, as a, um, a more um, comprehensive term. And, uh, and, and also, um, and this really um, struck home with, with um, Carolyn Quijata's talk this morning, is re rethink the kinds of stories we, we need to tell um, about the, a wide, wide range of, of, of challenging urban issues in order to develop a new kind of culture-based knowledge and um, action for just cities. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have 25 minutes, well, a little bit more, 28 left of this session, and if, if everybody keep their seven minutes slot, I think we can make it. So, next speaker um, is Dr. Michael Oloko, who is a senior lecturer and dean, researcher and dean of School of Engineering and Technology, JUST, and he's also the deputy director of the CLIP platform. Your research focuses on water resources, on environmental engineering, on solid waste, renewable energy technology, and management. And also, you're involved in project with urban agriculture. And you will talk about solid waste management. Thank you so much, Henrietta. Uh, it's a privilege to stand here before you and uh, uh, lead this discussion on very emotive issue on solid waste um, management. Uh, we do understand that uh, we continue producing waste wherever we are, are wherever we live, but uh, somehow for some time uh, those who handle the waste have not been uh, uh, looked at uh, with respect. We need to understand here that uh, the waste handlers commonly referred to as uh, the Chokora Mapipa. There's uh, an expression, or even excavenger, excavengers, that is a derogative term. Uh, the services that they render to us is quite important. They make our environment clean and safe for us to stay. Uh, we also need to understand that in as much as we produce waste, nobody would need waste uh, in his or her backyard. We've had issues in Kisumu, issues with regard to the management of waste on the site, relocation of the dam site that is located within the city, and even identification of a site for the construction of a sanitary landfill. Those are issues of priority within our county government. Uh, as such, Kisumu is not unique in having these challenges. Waste, uh, solid waste management is a global concern. And we do appreciate the efforts uh, taken up by individual countries or municipalities in this. But in this collaborative project, we do appreciate that the various efforts need to be compared. So, uh, so then we have this comparative and collaborative project on solid waste management uh, together with the SCONE local interaction platform in Malmo, Sweden. So uh, Kisumu local interaction platform work together with the SCONE uh, in this. Waste management is taking varying trends. It's becoming more complex. We do understand that our current uh, waste management systems and technologies therefore need to be reviewed. 
First and foremost in this collaboration, I do not know whether this would be possible, but we need to look at waste as a resource just in a wrong place. It is a resource that you can take advantage of. Uh, the Mistral Awan Futures uh, co-production approach brings on board various uh, stakeholders to share ideas and knowledge for development of various technologies and upscaling these technologies for the realization of, just, of a just city. This collaboration, therefore, intends to consider all the components of the solid waste value chain uh, for improvements and technologies to provide renewable alternative materials. And this is very key in our collaboration in that when you look at what would motivate, motivate uh, a waste actor into uh, continuing to do what he's doing even to a larger scale, then uh, we look at the benefits that this actor would get from this. We also have a scenario like in Kenya, the burning of the, uh, the plastic bags, and we know uh, it has it had some advantages, and we were using it in particular ways. Do we have an alternative for the pol uh, for the polythene bags that were banned? So uh, we explore various ways of coming up with alternative technologies that can give us alternative materials. Then we move to the levels of uh, solid waste management, and here we take note of the uh, fast urbanizing world and uh, the complexity of the waste management issues. And we do realize that at the first level, mere dumping of waste should be least considered. Uh, some people say that it should never even be considered waste dumping. As you can see on the screen, the first part is the first level where we have uh, a dump site. The dump site here is a Kachok dump site. Maybe if you have time, then we may uh, go there. We also realize that diverting waste from the landfills and increasing recycling rates might no longer be sufficient in terms of motivating the actors in the uh, waste uh, management sector. So again, even at this second level, uh, sanitary landfill, in as much as we feel we need to consider, you know, we are greatly concerned in the establishment of a sanitary landfill as a, as a Kisumu city. But we need to think beyond this, that in as much as we do this, it may be a short-term measure to, our, uh, to solutions uh, for our solid waste management challenges. We do appreciate then in the collaboration that in as much as we may be different in one ways, one country to another, Sweden and Kenya, there is uh, a common goal of improving efficiency uh, in the processing and utilization of waste resources, as well as finding alternative renewable, uh, renewable materials for, for use. So this is our greatest concern in this, in much as, as we share the ideas and the expertise from the different uh, labs. Is there a way we can identify some of these technologies that can be of use to us, both to uh, Sweden and even to Kenya, and of course, even to the neighboring countries within this region. And that is why we have this comparative project between the two LIPS, just to utilize the experiences and expertise, and particularly develop mechanisms for effective and sustainable waste resource management and networking. The project focus. Uh, the main focus here it is to create space for uh, a new idea incubation, conceptualization of issues, and development of new uh, platforms. Easily said, therefore, we need to have uh, some kind of a, a a startup platform and a learning space. So the collaboration would be sharing of ideas, sharing of new knowledge, and even having the physical space for demonstration of some of these technologies. The second part is to create some kind of a test bed, 
test bed for new technologies. We know in handling these materials, new ideas will be coming up and we'll be having new technology. Is it possible that we test the effectiveness of these technologies and if they can work, then we upscale them? So that is another, another level. So the collaboration is acting like some kind of a test bed of the new ideas and the technologies that we can think of. And as also some kind of a creation of supportive legal and institutional framework because we cannot succeed without the legal and um, institutional framework. So it may require establishment or review of certain uh, legal uh, and policy issues and also establishments or rev uh, uh, restructuring some of these institutions that are involved. I want to say for the success of this uh, collaborative project, there are some assumptions or certain issues that we have to anchor our efforts. There is the support and goodwill of the city that would be necessary for this uh, project. And I'm pleased to say that uh, based on the ongoing activities, the support and the goodwill of the city is not in doubt, given the priority they have on this particular issue. The city has created uh, an opportunity to have the space, the physical space, uh, where we can test some of these uh, technologies, where we can have some demonstration. Of course, also we have the material available, that is the waste. We have the waste from the market, from our uh, residential areas. Of course, there's no question about the waste. We could have doubted about the space, but already there is a, a, a the, the, the city has given us uh, the space. And of course, we have the waste actors. So the waste actors here are going to help us in identifying some of the local initiatives. And when we have to get some innovation, innovations in this, then they, they must relate to the initiatives that are ongoing. One thing about waste management is that you cannot stay with waste within your environment. Somehow, even if the municipality does not provide the service, in a way, you will have uh, something to do about the waste. Either move it to a different location, but you'll get some kind of coping mechanism. And we are pleased that uh, some of the local waste actors are really doing quite uh, an encouraging work. And we can build our research on this initiative to develop it further with the belief that it would be easily acceptable and uh, upscaled. The motivation in this, as I said, even uh, having a landfill is not the best solution for this. We need to find of some kind of motivation for the waste, waste actors. What benefit would they get? For the researchers in this, the sharing of new ideas and testing of various technologies that may succeed uh, or may not succeed will be on, of benefit because they are keen on getting new knowledge. But for the waste actors, there is need for some social, environmental, and economic gain that we need to focus. So when we look at waste as a resource that can be utilized to generate income, I think that would create a motivation for the waste actors and then would be able to utilize all the waste that we could have in our environment. The idea is to limit as much as possible the quantity of waste that we take to the dump site or we take to the land, uh, landfill, just in case we have. So uh, the, we need also to focus on the increased waste reduction and economic uh, resource management as opposed to expensive uh, waste disposal. So that is uh, another focus that we need to have. We need to understand that just disposal of waste is not motivating and is not uh, sustainable. We have the city with limited capacity to provide waste management services to all areas. As it is now, they only have the capacity to service the market areas and the CBDs. The re all the residential areas and the estates, these do not have 
uh, access to these very important municipal uh, service. So as such, the waste actors are coming up with various ideas, but again, there is need for more sensitization so that we need to understand waste that uh, it is just a resource and then we should not fear handling it. So we focus on issues to do with recycling and issues, issues to have utilizing the resource to come up with new products that can be of benefit to us. So as I end, we are keen on developing new alternative renewable, renewable materials. Sorry. <laughs> as, as I end, I think, yeah, as I end, uh, we are keen on developing new alternative renewable materials and uh, in our breakout session, we shall be discussing much about this. I know there are quite a number of representatives from the city in the waste management sector. We welcome you. And uh, we are also uh, privileged to have uh, Mr. Dusan uh, from, uh, from uh, a company. Mr. Dusak Rusevic is from Vera Park Company in Malmo. Uh, specializing on development of uh, such renewable uh, products. So we'll have discussions with them, and he has even carried with him one of the samples that can be used, consider for replacement of uh, uh, polythene. Has the same properties as polythene, but it is biodegradable. Thank you. <clears throat> So we still have three more themes to be presented, and the next one is Neighborhood Transformation and Development, and we will meet Magnus Johansson, former director of Skåne Platform, Local Action Platform, and a senior lecturer in environmental science at the Department of Urban Studies at Malmö University, where you have a specific focus on sustainable neighborhoods and on conditions for co-production in urban development. And you have a long experience of ongoing evaluation of sustainable urban development projects. Thank you. Um, I will try to be, thank you for being here. Thank you for being right in here. I will try to be rather short because I think everyone is looking for lunch, which is probably much more interesting than listening to me. And also, I would like to especially thank you, Caroline, for your speech because I had a, done a presentation and then I listened to you, I rewrite the presentation because you actually bring up lots of the issues because the right to the city could also be described as the right to the neighborhood. And, and who could live in certain neighborhood? Who could allow, who are allowed to be in certain neighborhood and who can afford to be in certain neighborhood? And the neighborhood development could be both the starting point for development of more justice city, but there are also lots of pitfalls and um, risks with neighborhood development. So neighborhood development could also turn out to, to be a problem and, and, and to lead to processes of gentrification. And I will illustrate this with three, three pictures from my hometown. Um, I will start with this picture because today's planning and today's building is tomorrow's neighborhood. Uh, this is a picture from a rather fancy area in Malmö, Western Harbor, when we are building sustainable houses. They are energy efficient, uh, they are built with good materials, they are built to the kind of technical idea of, of sustainable development, but they are expensive. So they are built for a certain group. They are built for the group that Ricky mentions before, the, the creative class. Uh, probably not many culture workers could live in these houses because they are really expensive. So when we plan our house, when we plan our city, when we build our city, we maybe plan for future problems and we maybe plan for segregation and we build for segregation. And uh, we develop neighborhoods that are not accessible and they are not, not, not just. Because, again, you talk about the right to the city. And, and we come to, to this part of the right to the city to talk about access to housing, access to, to land, access to housing. I think it's one central issue to discuss when it's come to neighborhood development. But time change everything. You realize that when you, like me, become into the middle age. And some fancy neighborhoods could 
become declined and, and problematic neighborhood. And I will show the, this is a picture from one of the neighborhoods in Malmö that is considered to, to be social, economic, vulnerable and, and decline. And of course, this is so important. This illustrates also the importance of international collaboration and international comparisons, because I think the neighborhoods in Sweden that are labeled as problematic and declined <laughs> are probably not seen as this in an international, international level. It's also right that what we mean with a just city, what, what we mean with a sustainable city must also contextualize, as Lefebvre notion. We need, we need to, to realize that. And um, we'll just go through some... I think there's, some, there's a trap. It's a pitfall, a trap in neighborhood development that you could, you could develop because neighborhoods is about identity, it's about a sense of belonging, it's, it's about to be a part of a community. And when you become a part of a community, when you live in a, in a, in a neighborhood that you feel comfortable with and, and, and you, feel, you feel safe, that could also be a neighborhood that could be very exclusive, that you exclude others. You, you protect your neighborhood. You're satisfied with, with your neighborhood and you have this NIMBY phenomenon, not in my backyard, that of course we should build affordable housing for other citizens, but not in my neighborhood. Of course we, we, should, we should open up for immigrants and we, we should open up, but not in my neighborhood. So the neighborhood transformation and neighborhood development is, is Janus face it. And it's also evoked the questions about scale, because it's easier to get trapped into the, the risk. Another risk for neighborhood development is that you get trapped in, in a very, very local scale, and you tend to forget that neighborhood development must must relate to and, and correspond to to uh, large scale development, city development, and regional development. Otherwise, you you, you can have a, have a development when you when you feel insecure in the city, you hide, if you could afford, you hide behind gated communities. You, you develop a neighborhood that you feel safe, but you're having a kind of archipelago of, of neighborhoods that people with a special identity feel safe, but this kind of archipelago creates a landscape of risks and, and uncertainty. So you need to be, you need to be aware about the, the pitfalls and, and the, the dark sides of neighborhood development. Um, just take a look. Okay, let's go to talk about, because we will have a breakout session to, uh, about neighborhood development, and these breakout sessions will be divided into two parts. The first part will be about more general, open part, uh, and the second part will be more, more closed, because we have launched a collaborative initiative between Malmö and Manchester and Gothenburg that we would like to learn about each other from neighborhood development. We get funded from East Urban Future. And I think it's important to have this kind of uh, collaborative and this kind of learning to, to understand and to share experience of neighbor development. And I will illustrate it with the last picture. This is my colleague, Peter. And Peter is watching into something called a future telescope or a future binocular. It was a project that City of Malmö has. And in ordinary telescope, ordinary binocular, the ordinary telescope just make reality sharper. It's in large reality. This is not, this is not the case future binocular, because if you look inside here, you don't see the surrounding, you see a picture of how the surrounding could look like. You put in a picture, and when you turn around, you can see how this thing changed. And I think when we talk about realizing just cities, we're talking about neighborhood development, we must really struggle to liberate ourselves from the cities we are living in to know, because Sometimes we, we think that the cities we are living to now is the only way a city could be organized, a city could be developed. So I think the core in Mr. Urban Future and the core in the collaborative explore is to learn to each other and to, to use this collaboration as this kind of future binocular. I use this collaboration, use, use the visits in different cities, use, use the change of experience as a way to, to enlarge our own understanding and also discuss those really important questions that Caroline brought up in his lectures about, for example, an epistemology of, of the commons and how neighborhood development could be a tool to create a more just city and how we could work to avoid that neighborhood development instead become a process of gentrification and segregation and uh, an unjust city. 
So that's what we will dive into and discuss more in our theme. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Magnus. And I invite our last, our second last speaker, Lisa Kirola from African Center of Cities, where she's a researcher, and uh, her research issues address land, housing, and infrastructure, and especially what we will hear about here, what you call the infrastructure of infrastructure, public finance. Thank you. I know everyone's hungry, so I'm actually going to take even less time than my seven minutes. I think you'll be happy to hear that. All right, so yeah, I'm here to talk about urban public finance. I think for many people, public finance seems like a black box, something that they don't understand and they don't want to engage with. I'm going to try to see if we can facilitate a little bit of an opening of that black box today. So urban public finance can mean a number of things. It can refer, for example, to the way in which money flows through urban authorities, the way in which urban authorities raise revenue, budget, expend, and audit. For anyone who works in Kisumu, you'll wonder who is the urban authority, and I think we're still trying to figure that out in the post-evolution context. It can also refer to urban public services, the way things like roads, uh, water, electricity, solid waste are delivered. Now this may or may not be delivered by an urban authority and I think as we all recognize in Kisumu, there's many actors which engage in this process from private sector players to other spheres of government. These are of course intersecting issues and as Caroline spoke to earlier, there's not clear boundaries necessarily between them. The majority of work on urban public finance has been conducted by quite a small group of international experts working at multilateral institutions like the World Bank, UN Habitat, and the like. These organizations have undeniably contributed hugely to the conversations about urban public finance in African cities, less so in the South African context, but definitely in, in other parts. They have pretty good ideas about how to make more efficient revenue collection, what are the best practices in budgeting, how you deal with efficient and uh, transparent procurement and the like. However, at the end of most of the reports, they say all these things we tried more or less were waylaid by political and social elements which we can't really deal with. And then they go back. They say, let's digitize the cadastra, let's put in place more participatory budgeting, etc. So what if we expand the study of urban public finance? What if we look beyond the technical and managerial approaches? What if we take in and understand these practices, but even push it further? In this platform, we hope to consider public finance and all of its complexity. To do this, we begin by saying public finance does not just fund infrastructure, it is in fact itself an infrastructure. Perhaps we might see it as the infrastructure of infrastructure. It includes complex flows, decision making, calculations, material systems, social, political, cultural practices, which all come into configurations, networks, maybe assemblages, as they operate in space. So we can all see how water, transport, um, and other infrastructures we engage with every day might bring these issues together. You might see that there's a technical road, but there's also social and cultural ways that people engage with it. But public finance seems a bit outside of that. We're trying to say that's actually not true. From our interviews, from our engagements with the city of Cape Town, also with Kisumu, we're seeing that this is very much the case. I'm now going to just give a few quick examples. If you take Kisumu, for example, land rates, you'll see that the way that they decide whether or not one pays a flat rate or an ad, ad valorem rate for land is not based on whether it's freehold or leasehold or whether it's technically inside or outside of the city boundaries. It's in fact based on whether or not it's perceived to be ancestral land or in fact bought and sold by the market. This is something that we need to take into account when we think about transforming, for example, the rate system. In Kasumu as well, if you speak to the local utility, Kiwasco, which manages the water, you'll hear about their delegated management model where they allow micro enterprises to expand the water network into unplanned areas. Now there's a lot of pressure from the World Bank, for example, to do right pricing, appropriate uh, tariffing on the water, but Kiwasco recognizes that by expanding this network and allowing for micro-enterprises to operate, they're in fact lowering what is called non-revenue water. They're lowering the sort of theft and material losses in the system that they're experiencing. So they may be giving more subsidized water, but they're simultaneously actually having huge financial gains. Closer to home, and Christabel spoke about this earlier, in Cape Town, the conditional grant that we have for free housing delivery enables thousands and thousands of houses to be built every year. However, the design, the fiscal architecture of this grant, in fact, pushes poor people to the urban edge, creating huge political, social, and even fiscal ramifications. 
Through the urban public finance work of the LIF, we hope to respond to the dire need for new creative interdisciplinary ways of thinking about urban public finance, particularly in African cities, but in our other partner cities as well. Everyone, uh, there's many faces in the room who have worked with me, I've interviewed in this process, and I want to thank everyone for being a part of it. I hope that even the other the other major projects, whether it's uh, transport or waste management, will see, we'll come to see that the public finance uh, lens can contribute, in fact, also to your projects. Thank you. Thank you, Liza. And then, last but not the least, Beth Perry, Professor Beth Perry, welcome back to the stage. And you will speak about participatory cities. And uh, a short introduction to you is that your, beyond being a professor, uh, professor for, pres, professorial fellow at the Urban Institute of Sheffield University, you are also the LIP director of Sheffield Manchester LIP, as we know, but your distinctive interests embrace a range of approaches, including how researchers can go beyond critique in realizing just cities. And uh, your focus lies especially in the interface with arts and humanities perspectives and within new forms of governing in cities which are more participatory based. Okay, thank you. I have an even more unenviable task. We're already late and you're hungry. Um, so I'm going to really try to paraphrase. Um, there are just three things that I think it's important to say in this short presentation. Um, the first is to give you a flavor of where we are and the challenges. Um, the second is to talk about some of the critical questions that are raised as we think about participatory cities. And the third is to give you a flavor of what we are doing and some of the options that we might take in developing this comparative project. As Henrietta said, they're all very different and this one's quite early on. Um, we talk about just cities. We've talked a lot about those in terms of the outcomes we want to achieve. Um, our focus is on realizing this is a process. So we really need to think about the processes through which we intend to do this. How are we going to achieve these aims? Transparency, fairness, inclusiveness, these are just all buzzwords. But what's actually going on in these processes? Who's involved and whose knowledge matters? So within Mr. Urban Futures, this is the strategic goal that we set ourselves a while ago, uh, improving relationships and processes amongst governance stakeholders. Um, and more recently, this has been reflected in two of the cross-cutting SDG goals. Um, one uh, from goal 11 around planning and participatory pl management. Uh, one and then two from goal 16, which are around participatory institutions and participatory decision-making and management processes at all levels. So sitting underneath this are two fundamental questions. Who's making decisions? And do people believe that these processes are actually inclusive and responsive? So the questions that this gives us then, are these kinds of targets um, enough? Do they go far enough? Are the targets appropriate? What's really going on inside some of these participatory processes? And what are the aims um, behind them? We heard a lot of critique from Caroline as well, which is really helpful here. Is the aim of participation just to legitimate existing decisions amongst governance stakeholders? Is it to improve efficiency, quieten dissent, um, or is it actually about genuine empowerment? And then we've got this whole causal dilemma. Do just processes actually lead to different kinds of outcomes? And how would we know? So the second key question that we need to ask ourselves is who then is involved? We've used this word stakeholders. It's really nebulous. And we referred this morning to the fact that we've interpreted that in a particular way. Stakeholders includes and excludes. And we really need to think about what kinds of new elites we might intentionally or accidentally be making. Um, and what are the preconditions that enable people who are facing hunger, poverty, to actually participate? What's in it for them? So in terms of what we're doing, we really need to engage with these questions around the conditions, the processes, um, and the partnerships that are needed to realize Just Cities. But we have to take that inside our own family as well and think about what our roles are as boundary agents, whether we're academics or whether we're local authority officials, and what roles of our platforms are as well. So these are some of the things we're going to think about in the workshop. Um, we're going to hear presentations from Gothenburg about their impact of participation, looking at planning processes across municipalities in Sweden, um, and their Go Create network of uh, local authorities and other public sector organizations who want to learn about um, democratic engagement techniques. We're going to hear about the Social Sustainability Commission in Malmo. We're going to hear about action research projects in Greater Manchester and cases from Kasumu and Cape Town inside participatory processes. To take it forward, I think we've got around five options, um, and the outcome of our session will hopefully be some clarity on these. 
Um, one of them, of course, is to mainstream some of these really important questions around participation within some of our other projects around the urban SDGs or around realising just cities. Um, one of the options is to critically reflect on our roles as platforms achieving greater participation and our roles as agents of change. We might decide to bilaterally twin some of our projects. We might decide to set up peer learning networks um, or to use the opportunity of the comparative network to really understand what works in participatory urban governance. So at the end of the uh, conference, hopefully we'll get back to you a little bit and tell you more about what we have decided. Um, but that's it for me from now. <laughs> So thank you, Beth, and thank you, everybody, for being with us so long. And I hand over to Sam for further instructions for lunch.